Hello, friends. Welcome back to Anti Chess Law. Again, I have a wonderful special guest with me, Kex09 from Slovakia, masterful player, number, hey guys. number one. Welcome. Uh, how are you going? Yeah, pretty fine. Just woke up on Sunday. So let's go. <laughs> nice chill. Excellent stuff. So I think uh, a lot of people will be pretty keen to hear your insights into anti chess, how you became so good, but also a little bit about yourself. So, yeah, how did you kind of first get into online chess and chess in general? And how would you get into it? Yeah, I was like three or two years ago playing just standard chess with my friend in real life and like we know nothing and all we wanted was just to beat the other and we just used to play once or twice a week and then the pandemic came so i was like what should i do and i was like okay let's try to play some chess and so i just opened up youtube wrote something like chess magnus carlsen and that was the website called leeches so yeah i opened it up signed in and played a few games i think i played like one month of standard in there and then i discovered something like variants what is it i opened up first one called anti chess uh, played i think three or four games uh, then i got mad because i will never play this nonsense again that's exactly <laughs> what i call so, <laughs> yeah that's, yep. that's what i said and then two months i think right after that uh i just was like okay maybe let's give it one more chance because i'm terrible at standard and there are 1000 rated players beating beating me so let's maybe try and then i beat somebody rated about 1700 and i was like okay this never happened in standard to me so maybe i have potential in here and i started playing anti-chess so why why anti chess uh, apart from the other variants? What what was the real attraction to that? Was it because you just had better results, or it seemed more fun somehow? Well, I beat my first seventeen hundred Reddit player there, so I was like, maybe I can play this, but I don't know. Uh, I also tried three check. I, I think I usually got made it in five moves. I don't know. <laughs> and about crazy house, I was like, I have no clue where are the pieces. How can I have four? same uh colored bishops i was like okay this is too hard of the variants, if you're a good chess player they come more naturally like when, when i play three check and crazy house it, yeah. it's not too bad but i think for players yeah who, who really like maybe are not really strong chess players it's different enough to think yeah i could be really good at this no matter what you know that background so maybe that helped too yeah yeah my standard knowledge was something around 1300 back then so uh, those chessy variants like Crazy House and, uh, for example, Three Check and, and the King of the Hill, they were too hard for me to even yeah. win a game. And those like Atomic Racing Games and Anti Chess, you know, the, the, those are a bit easier because you don't use the classic chess patterns in them. So yeah. I chose Anti Chess that day. <laughs> Good choice. And <laughs> Um, so actually, I mean, I, I know the answer to this question, and a few others do, but maybe you can tell us a bit about Kex09, the story behind that. Well, the story behind that is kind of funny, but I used to also play ice hockey, and Kex in Slovak language is something like a buffer bar, like a cookie bar, something. And when we were playing matches, I always had something in my back pocket, something sweet, just to eat something uh, in the intermissions. And I always had some cakes with me. And people were usually jealous because they had none. So they started calling me cakes and 09 was my number on the jersey. So I just put it together and signed in as cakes 09. Uh, I should I should have asked you to bring some with you to show, but um, they're like chocolate wafers, I suppose. But um, yeah, yeah making <laughs> good, good <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So when when you sort of got very strong on anti chess, uh, you began playing c4 on your first move, uh, which is a bit different. I mean, most people play e3. So what what kind of made you make this transition to c4 and then have all that success with it? Well, the main problem back then for me when I was playing E3, because I was playing it like half a year or something till I reached 1800, I think, 
But the problem there was the Fianchetto, bishop b7. So annoying line and so tough to convert when you are not... Really? Uh, b7 was, was, the, was yeah. the catalyst. That's very I, I hated it so much because in bullet games like 1 plus 0 arenas, I had so much problem uh, converting it because, uh, you know, you have material advantage, space advantage, and low time. And I was like losing more than half of them because of uh, problems with like uh, speed and whole setup for the win. So then I think it was Finlip's uh, rapid anti chess league. It was five plus five time control. And I was thrown into the group of lions, the unknown guy reborn, yourself, Flo, and Koto, for example. And I had to play with them. I, I saw people playing E3 against me. And then there was Koto. And he was playing C4. And I was like, OK, I know how to defend E3 at least until some point. But how to defend this C4? Like, what to do? And there I asked, never mind again, to give me some tips on how to like defend Koto's opening. And then we got into talk with Koto. And it started somewhere there. Yeah, right. You know, I, I think. That bishop b7, I, it's interesting you say that because some other people have said the same thing to me. It, it was very frustrating and they just went, oh, I don't want to face that, especially in fast time controls. You, you either change your opening or you learn exactly how to smash it. They're kind of your two options. With that. Otherwise, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I played c4 myself for a time. I, I, I think I asked um, Sequela about my stats. He was able to find it. And I played actually hundreds of games as one C4 at one point. So I was really into it, but I was actually a discussion, <laughs> never mind again, that made me come back to E3. I said, should I play C4? And he goes, E3 is the best. So, okay. <laughs> I, I almost joined, joined you there, but uh, still a fun opening to play, absolutely. And what about, the, well, the thing about C4 is it does lead to some queen races sometimes. Now, yeah, this can does. be the very bad depending on your enjoyment of queen races and um it, it can look like a bit of a coin flip sometimes if you're not uh, really used to it but there are some um i suppose tips about how to deal with that so maybe you can uh, give some of a quick education uh, sure of course uh queen races when i started playing c4 uh, i faced a lot of queen races and not just from koto but also from different players and I had really troubles to like make the position at least not losing for me and then I was asking around like how to queen race what to do and for example let's start with few I've got them written in here so here we are the six I think most important tips to queen to how to queen race and for this don't take the third rank and sixth rank for in general cases. And the best example, for example, here is the Sheng race, which goes from E3, E6. It's not the C4 line, but that race is a perfect example. And it's E3, E6, B4, Bishop takes, and Queen G4. And White is starting the race there, and uh, the Bishop of Black will capture the E3, uh, E3 pawn which will be, recap be captured by white bishop. And that's the third rank pawn. But black will still have the sixth rank pawn on the board. And after the race is finished, it's usually the sixth rank pawn, which will lose the game for the black because it will stay on the board. And white can have something like uh, queen, two rooks, or knight, for example. And it's completely winning for him. Yes, so it just gives you an extra option. You don't have to be forced yeah. on the second or seventh rank. So that's pretty nice. I, I, I kind of just avoid it. If it's e3, e6, um, I can play queen f3 instead and avoid it. But yeah, I mean, obviously, that, that line, if, if you know it, um, it's going to be yeah, winning if you know it. You know, so. yeah, there are many strong players with uh, this line. It's called Shank Race by the engine who was playing it before. Like Flo, Pini, Azoha, and all these guys, they are almost perfect. Also, Guru Hochet Grom. Okay, the second tip, you always need to count the number of pieces and pawns that you and your opponent have. 
if you have less, you can go for queen race because uh, if there will be queen race starting and you have less pieces, you can still like wait somewhere in his army of pawns and the rook maybe uh, in the corner, for example. You can yeah. give yourself some options to let him clear your pieces and then finish where you want to yeah, you let me. Get a high, then you had that extra time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And the third tip is if you have given up too many pieces and pawns, uh, it's better to go for queen race and vice versa. Uh, yeah, for example, if you have one knight, king and queen and your opponent has a much better piece advantage, for example, and you know you will have troubles in the end game, like you will have, for example, knight, king and too many pawns, you can go for queen race because it's uh, uh, very unpleasant to play end game like this. And you know it also that if you have too many pawns in the end game and no good major pieces, you're probably in trouble. So Absolutely. that's also a very good advantage. Yeah, it's advantage to go for a queen race if you can somehow destroy the position of your opponent also. And sometimes what I do is that I can maybe, I recapture the queen and then I also take a few more pieces uh, like if I, I don't have to, but I do it because just to make it uh, uh, less, like, let's say, less pleasant to play for my opponent. Like, just to keep him one or two rooks, maybe one knight, and just to capture even more pieces to destroy the position even more. And fourth tip is that the pawns are the weakest. So you don't want to capture all the pawns like few people few people do. Like, let's take all the pawns and open up the rook, bishop, everything. Let's open up everything. That's usually not good because uh, your opponent can uncount un you and uh, takes, for example, uh, a pawn with the rook also. And now you will be racing against two or three pieces. Things, right? Yeah, it's it's a bit complicated thing, but once you will get into it, uh, you will see the patterns and stuff you have to do and follow. So try to capture the pieces first, and as I said, uh, leave, for example, knight there and the rook, maybe some bishop. Uh, it's better to keep him the stuck pieces, for example, like the two or three. You know, he will have he will have a problem to deal with. For example, fifth tip is to always have options for your queen. If you have only one possible move, you might be in trouble. And that's exactly uh, what I was not following when I was racing at first. I was just taking something um, like, like uh, let's take this pawn because he can recapture it with the rook. And he also did. And he, his queen was infiltrated in my structure. And those are the moves you have to make perfectly to not lose in fourth sequence. So, yeah, it's usually better to have the queen on the board longer than your opponent, because then you can choose uh, what else will you make with your infiltrated queen. And infiltrated queen is very strong material. Keep that in hand. So, sixth tip is to don't let your opponent capture your queen too early in a queen race. Yeah, that, that's it. That leads yeah, to problems. Evident because uh, you just lose those options. You, you basically want to maximize all those options and losing the queen. Yeah. Yeah. Then the queen just has more options to sit there and take a rook and yeah. Cause exactly. Yeah. Great. Okay. That's that's really good tips. Um, so anyone watching who's a bit mystified by queen races, hope that clears things up and uh, makes it a bit easier for us. Um, right, so you've actually got uh, a couple of your favorite games you'd like to show us, I believe. So I'm looking forward to seeing a couple of those. Oh, yeah, there were a few, and I had troubles to choose the right ones, but I came up with these three. And the first game is against Firebat Prime, let me switch to my side, and a very good friend of mine, and we also know him from the last interview. Uh, it was a 5 plus 0 game, but we both berserked and so it's two and a half minutes for both. So I opened with c4, and he responded b5, and takes d6. This is line I used to face uh, usually 
with Flow, Grohoche Chrome, and Pins, for example. And I had really troubles converting it into something good. So I came here with my innovative move and very funny to play. So after D6, you have to sacrifice this pawn because there is this sequence and as F4 is not forced move, he will be allowed to play this. Oh, not this pawn and bishop. And that leads to direct mate. So I went F4 in this position. And as we know, Firebat, he just won't sacrifice this bishop here. He has to <laughs> like counter your innovative move with another one. So he played bishop to F5. Something looking completely silly, but very funny. And this line is called bishop invitation in the fake Polish. And this is the fake Polish move because usually the Polish goes from the, the queen side. So that's the fake Polish and bishop invitation. And we got into this uh, very funny position as there is no development on this side, but very weird looking this side of the board. So I just put the rook back to have the options of advancing this pawn, maybe attack the knight or something. So he moved back, knight to seven, and uh, I wanted to do something uh, about this because it's completely locked and there's no development. And this is also the structure from the Polish, usually on the king side, uh, queen side, but Firebat just bomb clouded me. Uh, <laughs> he was maybe looking for this to not allow my knight capture it and force me to take it with the pawn because there is this option and he can just move the pawn up, for example. So yeah, he just bomb clouded me. So I was like, okay, let's try to infiltrate it with queen. And he know very well that uh, he doesn't want to, let, to play me this. So he put the knight there, which was kind of interesting, but uh, not expected because I can just take it and double the pawns. So, well, I did it and put also my knight back because now there are no threats and I don't want to push this guy or somewhere here because I will be blocked and some bad chain can happen or something in the future. So I just waited a bit. And now he is like uh, opening up his queen, for example, for very, very good discovery and queen h4 is very strong, strong square for the queen because he can also take this pawn and here he has very good options and very nice fork. So let's move on, a uh, few slow moves, and now he sacrificed the queen, which I would probably not do because queen was very good material for my against my structure, as uh, I'm not developed very well in this position. You think so, he uh, did so he could undouble his pawn? Yeah, also, oh. yeah, yeah, right. Also, undoubling his pawn and trying to attack my knight here, but, uh, maybe some mate sequence in here. So I had to do something about it. So knight d3, trying to find something. And I think in the position, uh, there was mate very soon that I missed completely. And it was rook g1, it said, but also knight e5 was the main idea. But I was like, uh, after he pushed this pawn, I wasn't sure that I want to uh, just sacrifice the knight and then have no options and no pieces. So I wasn't sure. But still, the game continues, and this again, uh, the move recommended was rook e1, which is very oh, funny. <laughs> yeah, and the idea of the rook e1 move was to like distract this pawn and sacrifice this, and somehow open up the bishop. So rook I think e1. Would have seen that move. Yeah, Mr. Haggis, of course, Mr. Haggis, of course. <laughs> so I was like trying to make some space and. Here I played this problematic <laughs> sequence, which had forced me to play the rook e1 <laughs> anyway. So yeah, let's move on. And there's the move that came, the losing move. And I also remember Firebat saying, like, bishops on h6, a4, uh, a3, h3, and a6 can be very problematic. So don't place them there. So did he. And I was thinking for few seconds trying to find some sequence that I can take advantage of this and then I found this very interesting so I had to somehow take three pieces of this and this was the winning move for me bishop a3 take take 
take, 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 and the rook is loose. So yeah, that was a very fun game with Firebat, and I think he also posted this one to Instagram. Like uh, he did not follow his own uh, advices and rules, and he got very, very well punished for that. So yeah. So let's yeah, move on. You did the intermediate against the intermediate master, so that's yeah. pretty satisfying. <laughs> Not gonna lie, but it felt great. <laughs> yeah, let's move on to another game I played against Mr. Haggis. Okay, let's turn this off. And it was the shield game where I was facing Mr. Haggis. Uh, he was on big streak, I think. Let's just check it out if he's not billeted yet. Mr. Haggis, yeah, there he is. And he was riding a 12 game winning streak. Oh, I was wow. the only one who beat him in the shield. So, yeah. <laughs> so, let's go from my perspective. And E3 was played. So, I responded with Modern. I was hoping him to do his uh, weird trick with capturing this and this and this. Uh, recaptured with Queen because that's forced mate in 16 and he was playing it but nobody knew the refutation for that so I was just trying let's play the modern and let's hope for the best but after bishop a6 I know I will have to play something else so that's the basic position and queen f3 recaptured with knight now he was threatening uh, this very bad capture so I was just countering it with the queen g5 option. If he will take there, I will take here, and but oh, and he will of course recapture my queen back because that was what Haggis was doing all the time. So he captured on f7 this time. So I took his queen and took on e3, and this wasn't the best move uh, in this position maybe because c5 is it's looking fine, like pressuring the knight on this square. And but after knight moves, I forgot about the b4 square, which is kind of overloaded right now. And he played knight f1, which is considered as blunder. And I played knight e7, which is another blunder. And he found and spotted bishop d2 on my bad square in here. So I sacrificed the knight, which I didn't want it to before, but OK. And he again developing pieces instead of sacrificing them. And that was all, all I guess. So here I tried to attack his knight with the bishop and seen no intermediates for him. That would have been bad for me. And there's an exchange. And kind of equal game. The engine says it was a bit more better for me, but uh, it's just a little, little something. So he's now setting up something and kind of waiting game. And this was the move that led to problems. E4 was played by Haggis and the engine says made in seven. Uh, took me one second to find the mate, but I don't think it was one second. And sacrifice the pawn, another pawn. And there's a double capture. Yeah, there you go. You've got that, that yeah. line up there. That's, yeah. that's so knight c8 was played and queen and Haggis resigned in this position it was a very interesting game and full of blunders but only 69 average centipede loss which is pretty fine and i usually don't go that low against very random lines and positions so i was kind of happy that i also won the game against Haggis and i think he landed in my best victories list for some time with 2370 that and that's that's a huge rating he had back then then okay let's move on to the third game and it's very recent one happened only two days ago and it was also a shield game three plus two time control and the player i was play playing in this game was uh, sadly using an engine and people don't cheat it's not worth it because he got caught i think one or one hour and a half right after the shield so yeah it's it's not worth <laughs> cheating i think so well yeah. and uh, he was surprising but you know yeah. some people just have that 
that ego they can't stand to lose and they do silly things like that but yeah you're gonna get caught so yeah but, sadly he got removed but he was riding like yeah, so this game was was actually against uh, an engine we feel, and this is why it's quite interesting that he still said so he played so well. Yeah, and he was riding a a monster streak, and he got like 170 rating in that day, only in that one day. So I was like, okay, bro, you are 1900 for 50,000 games, and then suddenly you are 2200 in in no time. Like, okay. And also the time he was spending on the moves was uh, very bad. And everybody knew he was cheating like two hours or three, but he was still playing. So that's kind of sad, but okay, let's move on to the game. And he was playing the C3, which was reminding me the Haggis and his C3 opening. But okay, I was fully focused and I wanted to play with him and I wanted to beat him just for the good of the community. So there we go. C3, E6, A3 and Knight takes. And I think I've seen like five moves before we played and he was playing this line against Nana Nightmare. So I played B5 and C5 in this position, Rook takes, Rook takes, Bishop is sacrificed and Queen H4. So, and I know he is reading the chat and I also remember that he used this sequence against Nana Nightmare to take, for example, I leave the options here. I think he took just the king. So I was just writing to chat that, okay, now he will take the knight and now he will take the king. And I think he saw it and took the pawn <laughs> right here on d7. So it kind of helped me because I was not looking to lose my king against the engine. Usually it knows how to punish it. So I recaptured it back and c4, very good move in this position. And I was also considering taking it and maybe open up the queen or something but there was another problem if i would take c4 pawn uh, he would have also this posit this move that would lead to something very annoying and i i wasn't ready for this against an engine so i took on h2 and developing the knight to e7 Rook takes, and from now on, I think he was choosing just the best engine moves. It was like here, yeah, and I h3, rook takes, and I was trying to set up something uh, here, some double capture or something, because I would have also this at some point. And yeah, knight c8 was the move I was thinking about, but he found this beautiful move. Uh, it's bishop g2, this diagonal. That's hard. here and also here and that, that was yeah very insane move and also very beautiful move i wish he had find, found it on it on his own not with the engine but okay and here engine was recommending me to sacrifice the knight on c6 and just take it back with the king but i would be all again against this and just with solo knight and king so i decided to push the pawn instead to force him to sacrifice the bishop and because there will be then this sequence that leads to direct mate for me so he played b4 and bishop sacrifice on h6 this position is still looking very fine for me he's developing the king and here i found knight e7 because this position is also very interesting there is some some ideas can be because i can push the f pawn later and this pawn or should maybe stay on the board, but very complicated position. I was spending my time here, so was he. But we know why. <laughs> okay, that doesn't matter. And also, this is not a huge threat because, of course, if I will take it with the knight, uh, I think there are some problems should happen in this sequence, but I don't, I don't know if it's a forced mate or something. But if you will take it with the king, yeah, nothing can happen nothing can happen so i just developed the pieces and here i rather sacrificed the knight already because uh, i was going to be also low on time soon but also he was on 15 seconds so i wanted to take advantage of that and in this position this square is also overloaded twice and also this one so i decided to make some space and try to push the pawns and still 
overall it twice. Also that pawn series of few moves, and in this position he got flagged. But yeah, the position was kind of drawish, and I was really impressed with my play in this game because I expected to get punished for the first mistake I would do. So it's fine, and the game says just one blunder, one mistake, one in inaccuracy, 61 every centipede loss, and also the graph. Well, I had advantage, and it was like 6, 5.8, and, and something around this. That, that's just all from that opening, though. I mean, I think when it says yeah. two blunders, that's probably in the first three moves when he just played that C3 lion. Yeah. Which like, so I guess that's probably why, right? Yeah, but if you don't know how to convert it perfectly, you will probably end up in something rowish. And it was in this position where he took on d7. And let's just check the advantage number. It dropped to minus 1.1. So uh, it, it wasn't even my fault that the advantage was lost. But OK, I'll, I'll do those. It was it was funny game. And I said him also in the inbox to not ever cheat again. And also thanks for the nice farewell game. So yeah, that was it. Great. Yeah. Oh, thanks for showing those games. Um, yes, a really nice play. I think uh, my, my, my favorite one still probably that first one against Fire Path. That was just a thing of beauty. But uh, yeah, man, that was that was really cool. And thanks for your explanations. Um, you know, it, it's really great to hear what a master level player thinks and give their insights to the game. So thanks for coming along and, and sharing that with everyone today and for your time. Thanks for inviting me. It was very fun and looking forward to another cooperation in the future. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Kex. And uh, thanks everybody else for watching and I'll see you all next time.